This is In The Loop, I'm Christian Bryant. Thursdays kind of feel like a pregame for the weekend, so... It's water. Here's what we got for y'all. Tonight, what do you know about Juneteenth? An overlooked part of American history is now getting some national recognition and some new efforts to educate folks on the meaning behind the holiday. But first, here's what you need to know right now. The Supreme Court voted to uphold the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare today in a move that'll preserve insurance coverage for millions of Americans. This is the third time the Affordable Care Act has gone to the Supreme Court and the third time it's come out mainly intact. In short, the case was rejected because judges said Texas and the other states did not have a legal right to bring it back up. Here's the breakdown of how the justices voted on the ruling. On the left are the justices who voted to uphold the ACA. On the right, the ones who voted against it. Two of the three justices appointed by Trump voted to keep the law, most notably Amy Coney Barrett. When former President Trump picked her, he was confident she would vote to overturn the ACA. Democratic lawmakers were worried that was the case too. We can have the Affordable Care Act, or we can have Amy Coney Barrett on the Supreme Court. We can have the ACA, or we can have ACB, but we can't have both. Turns out that's not the case, at least in this case. The conservative-dominated court hasn't yet ruled on some other high-profile cases, including Brnovich v. DNC. That case raises some key questions on the reach of the Voting Rights Act. The court will consider Arizona's restrictions on third-party ballot collecting and out-of-precinct voting. New season, same problem. Extreme temperatures causing power outages and deadly conditions, only this time, it's sweltering heat. Right now, much of the western part of the country is under an excessive heat warning, and the states that aren't are still expecting higher than average temperatures for this time of the year. Several states like Montana, Wyoming, and Utah have heightened red flag warnings as the heat wave combined with a record-breaking drought creates a perfect storm for wildfires. In California, the work to put out the flames has already started. We're easily a month or more ahead of uh, fire weather conditions for this time of year. In Texas, record electric use had the Electric Reliability Council begging residents to preserve as much energy as possible this week. We'll get a little bit of relief from the heat next week, but longer term, things aren't expected to simmer down for people out west. Scientists who study drought and climate change say residents there can expect to see a lot more of this in the coming years. Lawmakers and advocates have pushed for decades to make Juneteenth a federal holiday, which would make this commemoration of the end of slavery a nationally recognized milestone. On Thursday, that campaign finally succeeded. By making Juneteenth a federal holiday, all Americans can feel the power of this day and learn from our history. Biden's signature on the Juneteenth National Independence Day Act made the date only the 12th federal holiday, and it comes after the bill flew through Congress this week with only minimal opposition from Republican lawmakers. Juneteenth, which is the combination of June and 19th, marks the day in 1865 when Union soldiers informed enslaved people in Galveston, Texas, that they were free. It was a delayed notification for people in Confederate territory. President Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation was signed two and a half years earlier. States have been making moves to pass their own Juneteenth legislation, especially in the last year. Right now, just about every state observes Juneteenth as a holiday. Not only that, but recent polling shows that most Americans know about Juneteenth and more people supported than opposed making the date a national holiday. But all that support for Juneteenth reveals some real dissonance in America right now. The Texas state NAACP president told USA Today that Juneteenth becoming a federal holiday is a hollow celebration pointing to a crackdown on voting rights that could disenfranchise many black Americans. And then there's this brouhaha over teaching race and history in schools. There's an interesting contradiction in recognizing the history of slavery in America, but wanting to put up guardrails around how or whether that history is taught. As Estead Herndon puts it, Juneteenth is gonna be a federal holiday for reasons teachers won't be allowed to explain to their students out of fear of critical race theory backlash. But some advocates still see bipartisan support for the federal holiday as a way forward and an overdue recognition of American history. What I see here today is racial divide crumbling, being crushed this day. 
under a momentous vote uh, that brings together people who understand the value of freedom. And that is what Juneteenth is all about. As we mentioned earlier, there have been discussions about how exactly to broach topics of race and American history in educational settings. And depending on the age group, there might be some challenges in crafting age-appropriate lessons. Newsy's Amber Strong tells us about how some educators are using puppets to teach young children about race and Juneteenth. Welcome to a world where monsters come to life and thespians transform into furry, fantastical creatures. Here at the Center for Puppetry Arts in Atlanta, performers like Brian Harrison are using puppets to educate. Today's lesson, just in time for Juneteenth, is on the African diaspora. These are three stories that come from Africa that allows me to highlight different things about each story and uh, the people uh, that, that created those stories. So we, we look at Africa as the continent, we look at Southern Africa and with the Bantu people. We go to Ghana and, and uh, uh, explore you know, some of their traditions. Harrison's virtual performance incorporates something educators have been saying for years. Teaching complicated lessons to children is easier with puppets. Puppets are often very disarming. Um, you know, it's, it's amazing to see how easily a child gravitates to a puppet. Um, and so you can really infuse a lot of education into basically what might be considered a toy. If we all have melanin, why are we different colors? It's something Sesame Workshop is also doing with the new Coming Together program, telling Newsy they're in it for the long haul, with a bilingual initiative meant to provide parents with online resources on race and racism. A new study from Sesame Workshop found 86% of American children 6 to 11 years old don't believe people of different races are treated fairly in the U.S. Across the country, people are finding unique ways to teach young children about Juneteenth. That's the day slaves in Texas were free, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation. Those lessons include everything from virtual museum visits to parades and performances. There are lots of resources. Books are one of my favorite, even, you know, increased access to videos of just introducing, right, what, what Juneteenth is about, what it means. And, and that's parents for me of all backgrounds, right? All children certainly need to know the history. Children's author and psychologist Miriam jernigan Nowesi says counter to what many parents have been taught, studies show children are not colorblind. A two-year-old um, who may understand the concept, you know, they may not understand racism, right, but they may understand the concept of what it means to not be treated fairly or to be treated differently. They begin to reason about their treatment uh, rela or related to race. She says age-appropriate lessons about race and history can prepare them for harder conversations in the future. Even though these are just, you know, fun folk tales and stories that I'm telling and none of them are hard hitting or anything like that. My goal is to spark conversation around black history and black stories. Um, so you get to see these black characters um, being heroes in their own stories. Amber Strong, Newsy. You didn't ask for this, but when you're back, we're giving you animal content. You are welcome in advance. Usually it's a little weird to just watch people eat, but we here at ITL are gonna make an exception for goats. Wildfire season has begun, and this year could be particularly devastating for some regions because of drought conditions. Newsy's Lindsay Thies shows us how some landowners are turning to a unique, environmentally friendly, and noisy little helper to help clear debris. from the farms of Central California All right. to the rocky hills of the Bay Area. This herd of more than 500 dairy and African boar goats is hard at work. They're an unconventional but effective tool to stop fires. Well, we built a fence probably, I'd say probably about five acres. Looking at the brush and everything like that, it'll probably be a couple days here. They clear away brush, eating it before it can become fuel for fires. And they eat a lot. A single 100 pound goat can chow down 12 pounds of green brush in a day. So do the math. There are about 560 adult and baby goats out here. By the end of today, they'll clear 6,700 pounds. There's plenty of work in California. These goats are just some of Mike Kennedy's herds. 
At his Colinga, California ranch, some 10,000 sheep and goats wait for their turn to ride the trailer to their latest deployment. Just the past couple of years, with wildfires intensifying, interest in large herds to cover vast stretches of land has his business booming. Uh, there's some that the fire breaks that we cut with the goats stop the fire. When you can change people's lives in that way, that's an emotional thing. Um, that they don't have to go through, it, it, and it's, it's just huge for us. These goats can stretch their necks up to seven feet, biting branches and low-lying leaves. They eat poison oak and can clear rocky cliffs, something other livestock can't do. And it's easier to control where the goats go to cut a fire break, unlike controlled burns, another method of removing wildfire fuel. All that's needed is a fence, a shepherd, and a couple of dogs. All of this dead grass and brush around us is really fuel for a wildfire to burn. That's why hundreds of businesses, public agencies, even private property owners now all across the West are really turning to goats and goat herders because for the goats, all of this is a buffet. The fire break that the goats leave is much better than uh, mowing or using herbicides. Jeff Weiss is with the California Department of Transportation, which began to use just a handful of goats to reach rocky areas like bridges. It worked so well, they're now bringing in even larger herds on the sides of highways. The fires are more intense. The fires actually can jump the highway. Um, and even if they couldn't, um, if a fire starts on one side of the highway, it can go miles in one direction or the other depending where the spark landed. They were deploying ahead of what is likely to be a horrific wildfire season. The drought here is so bad, the risk level for the southwestern United States has been stuck at critical for weeks. In California, every county in the state is in moderate to exceptional drought. Exceptional is the highest level. Even in non-drought years, we have fires, but in drought years, they're, they're wicked and they cause a lot of damage. A feast for goats, a life-saving tool for humans. It's the new reality in California. Lindsay Thies, Newsy, Fresno County. You know, there's a version of the story where Lindsay is actually feeding one of them. Let's see if we can get a picture. Yeah, there, that's it. How's that for a palate cleanser? The pandemic has been tough on many of us, especially when it comes to our mental health. Now, a new study involving several million people shows where thoughts of suicide were highest across the country. National reporter Maya Rodriguez has more. Aside from the infectious nature of COVID-19, there's also a mental strain the virus is placing on people the world over and depression is at the top of the list. People who took a depression screen to get a sense about how they were being impacted by the pandemic. Paul Gianfrido is president of Mental Health America, a nonprofit that provided mental health screening for more than two and a half million people all across the country in 2020. Then they analyzed the data they collected. We looked at suicidal thinking and self-harm thinking and discovered that 38% of the people who had taken a screen indicated that they had suicidal or self-harm thinking on more than half the days of the week. Because of the sheer number of people who participated in the screening, Mental Health America delved into the numbers by location. Their findings? The states with the highest number of people with thoughts of suicide were California, Texas, and Florida. It's not necessarily surprising considering their large populations. But when it comes to the highest percentage of the population contemplating suicide, more rural states, Alaska, Wyoming, and Alabama, jump to the top spots. All the changes, all this disrupt the disruptions to their lives have had an effect, and we can't overlook this. And the findings go deeper to county by county levels. The study found those with the highest percentage of people contemplating suicide included large counties like Bear, Texas, where San Antonio is, Clark County, Nevada, where Las Vegas is, and Riverside, California, east of Los Angeles. But it also included smaller counties like Carroll and Whitley counties in Kentucky and Switzerland County, Indiana. Even in these small counties that may not have the, the, the wherewithal or get the attention, there is a very deep-seated need uh, 
uh, in, in even those counties. Ann Hartree is with the pharmaceutical company Lundbeck, which helped fund the independently conducted Mental Health America study. When I saw these numbers, they are daunting, they are scary. Uh, but I think it's a really important view of reality that we gain so that we can actually start to step in, step up and step into it and, and find even more to do about it. That includes using $130 billion in available federal stimulus funding for local solutions. Then you have the opportunity in a local area or in a state area to use some of these new block grant dollars that are coming from the federal government. We can build a system for everybody. Uh, that, would, that would serve the needs of everybody at the earliest possible stages. So that people never get to the ultimate stage. Amaya Rodriguez. College legacy admissions have long been scrutinized, but Colorado recently became the first state to ban public universities from doing this. National reporter Thomas Hopoff says advocates for doing away with the legacy admission system hope that this move will spread nationwide. One of the questions that um, kept coming up in every application was uh, name the family members that attended the institution and what connection you have with the institution. Let's look at a student's merits. Let's look at their hard work. Let's not you know, give somebody an upper hand just because their parents or their grandparents went to that university. When someone applies to college, there's sometimes a box on the application asking about any relatives who attended the university. This is called legacy, something Pratik Dutta is far too familiar with. That always, you know, from the moment I was applying, rubbed me the wrong way. Like, why does that matter? Um, when I am, when you are deciding my application, why would uh, my family members and who attended the institution uh, have any bearing on whether I should attend or not? When my parents left Bangladesh and immigrated here, they told me that this is a country where no matter what your last name is, no matter what your family looks like or your family background, you can make it as long as you have a positive attitude, you work hard, and you play by the rules. The concept of legacy preference, putting a thumb on the scale for those who have family connections, is diametrically opposed to those values. Dutta has been fighting legacy admissions because he says it gives some students a leg up in the admissions process. According to a survey by Inside Higher Ed, 42% of private institutions and 6% of public institutions consider legacy status a factor in admissions. Now Pratik works in education policy. He says the practice of legacy admissions makes access to higher education less equitable. Some even give legacy uh, fee waivers. So every application you send, it's about 70, 80 bucks. Those fees are waived for those that have a family connection, which is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing. We should be waiving fees for those that are low income, those that are, uh, have hardships. We don't want someone to get that preferential treatment um, just because they had that, that relationship established already. Which is why State Representative Kyle Mullica says Colorado wanted to become the first state to ban legacy admissions for public universities. However, private schools like the University of Denver can still include legacy-related questions on applications. We want somebody to be looked at based on their merits, based on their hard work, is really what we're trying to focus on here. Um, you know, and, and we're not trying to make it harder on you either if you have a uh, family that went there. We just want to try to create that equal level playing field um, and make sure that we're being a leader in that and making sure that, uh, that, that, that these students are, are getting a more equitable way of getting into school. Pratik says one state doing this in the country is the key for more states to try and follow, which he and other advocates hope to see in the future. Some institutions such as Texas Tech, John Hopkins, and some private schools have done this, uh, but no other state has um, prohibited legacy preference in, in their state. Colorado is the first, um, but we, again, we do hope that this will um, allow uh, more states to understand that it's a possibility, and we do hope that this uh, you know, is, is perpetuated across the country. I'm Thomas Hoppo reporting. If you haven't done so already, feel free to reach out to us on Twitter using the hashtag Newsy in the Loop. Don't be shy. I'm just like you, a regular person. I tweet using one thumb at a time. I have an endless amount of tweet drafts that could get me fired. And I, too, could really use an edit button. Believers of the QAnon conspiracy theory have taken their guidance from an anonymous figure online, but it's not just believers who have been impacted. 
some of their partners say they've been so entrenched by the conspiracy, they've questioned their own reality. Our partners at Coda Story spoke to husbands, wives, and partners about what it's like to watch a loved one turn to Q. Together, we produced a three-part series to bring these perspectives to you. Each person is anonymous, and they share their own stories about losing a partner to a conspiracy theory. Here's part two. I was truly living in a completely different reality than the person I was married to. I put a lot of effort into trying to make sure that Q just wouldn't come up. As it grew and grew, this conspiracy in his mind, it kind of took over everything. We had met in college. We were very outdoorsy. That was kind of our thing. We used to go backpacking and camping and hiking. We could always like make everything a little bit better and a little bit more comfortable. And <laughs> it, it was a lot of fun. That declined around the time we got into Q a little bit more interested in conspiracy theories than the average person. It, it took a turn when Trump showed up. It wasn't that he was a Trump supporter or even a Republican, so it didn't really stem from his political affiliation at all. It really just kind of accelerated to a point where we were not living in the same reality anymore. We had a couple of times where Hugh had said that the world was coming to an end. Tonight's the night, it's happening right now. We have to pack up. You have to say goodbye to your family. The internet's gonna go down and then that's gonna be our signal from Q that, that the world is ending. And it was a very, just a very scary thing to live through. Somebody who has that much conviction that the world's going to end at 9.55 that night. You kind of start to lose your own sense and your own confidence in what you believe to be true when you're just constantly being inundated by QAnon stuff. And you start to wonder if maybe you're the one who's not informed. Those moments were very scary. I can't say I was super confident that the world wasn't going to end, even though logically it wasn't. I think kind of what kept me staying is that it feels so deceptively and frustratingly easy to fix, especially once he started talking about flat earth, stuff like that. And there's kind of this sense of like, oh my God, I should be able to convince him that the earth is round. I can do this, right? It can be really hard to let go. He didn't understand it. He felt that I was ending something good over political disagreements. Once you get past debating, you know, just political preferences into debating what's real and what's not, it just becomes this really draining, really exhausting thing. He was mainstream knowledge now. My parents know what it is. They just asked me about it. Like, was, was that QAnon? Was that what he was into? So it kind of came late, this validation. This is the kind of thing that does break up relationships. This might be a tipping point for a lot of people's family members. I hope that there are some people who finally start to see it a little bit more clearly now. If you're deciding to stay in a relationship on any level with somebody who believes in this stuff, you need to make sure you don't lose your own footing in the process, your own sense of what's real and what's not. Because you almost feel like you can fight it. And maybe you can. I couldn't. That's it for us, gang. As always, thanks for watching. We'll be back next week with more in the loop. Same time, same place. Top stories from Newsy are headed your way right now.